kids get up here and get set, but let's go ahead and stand together. Good night to worship the Lord. Let's worship. came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word, our light. He came to die, so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise, to show his power and might. That's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down, worship this King, cause He gave His everything, cause He gave His everything. He came to live, He came to live, live again in us, He came to be. Our conquering king and friend, he came to heal and show the lost ones his love. He came to go, prepare a place for us. That's why we praise him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down, worship this king. Cause he gave his everything Cause he gave his everything Oh, sing it to him, Halle Halle, hallelujah Halle, halle, sing it out Halle, hallelujah Halle Hallelujah, that's why we praise Him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer Him our everything, that's why we bow down, worship this King, cause He gave His everything, cause He gave His everything, that's why we praise Him, that's why we sing. That's why we offer Him our everything. That's why we bow down, worship this King, cause He gave His everything. Cause He gave His everything. Cause He gave His everything. Yeah, amen. Now that we're warmed up, jump into it here with us. Mighty to save. with a full heart. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. Give my life to follow, 
everything I believe in, now I surrender. Savior, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Amen. Yeah, good job. Amen. Good Hug job. somebody's neck. Shake their hand. Tell them you're glad you got to see them. Or if you strum that thing a little harder, you remind me of Trish. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Good job. Good job. Good day. Glad you got to be at church on Wednesday night. Yeah. Nothing long, hard day. No, y'all put in a good day today. Amen. Wando, mi hermano, bases, por favor. Roy, what, what, what's the word for where? Where? Donde? 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 Hermano Donita. They need it. Her, her mama didn't need it. Already, already put her to sleep? <laughs> wow. Juan said, you already put her to sleep. Man, I just give the introduction. Anyway, Chip, you tell your wife I'm trying to use my Spanish. The Aceano? Seen it? Breakfast, the eighth panel. Lunch, yeah, that, that's that what you said. That's so you know, like I said from up there, and then, <laughs> I knew I was saying it wrong because you were like, <laughs> and lunch, comida, and supper. Cena, like I said. <laughs> Danita has learned how to start teaching me because she said, well, hey, baby, how are you? Yes, yes. I thought my wife was showing the gift of prophecy there for a minute. She was reading my my, in, my outline to me. Um, but Danita decided that I'm too far behind. So what she's doing now to teach me my 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 Spanish is she is I'm, I'm working on food. She said I know the way to get to you get to thinking in Spanish. We're gonna talk about food. So I'm like, Amen. So I'm practicing now. Amen. And y'all heard how good I say it because I almost said breakfast. It started with a D. I remember that. Amen. I'm going to get there. Y'all watch. Y'all y'all watch. I'm going to speak so much Spanish I forget English. No, no, we're not going to start with nothing else. 
Hey, Venus said, you can learn French. I'm like, no, I'm going to just try to get it to one. If I get one, I'll be happy. You Hopefully, when you came in tonight, if you're our guest, I'm not normally so scatterbrained. Usually, I'm considerably more focused and civilized. But anyway, uh, we're glad you're here. Hopefully, when you came in, you received an outline that says, having gifts, having gifts, Romans 12, uh, verses 6 to about 8. If you did not receive one, would you raise your hand? We need one up here on the front, guys. Amen. We had an extra one here, so we're good. Anybody else need one? You had an extra one, Angie? Okay. Anybody else? Amen. I just saw Cindy. Cindy, you got one? I'm glad you're feeling better, girl, by the way. We're glad you're able to be at church. Amen. Everybody got one? You're going to want this, this outline, not because I'm preaching it, but this is one of those things that as a Christian, you need to be able to carry around in your life, okay? What we're going to talk about tonight, having gifts, is the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us to be able to accomplish His will. We've been talking about that as, since we started into chapter 12. But just in preface to that, when, when God saves you, He starts teaching you, I'm going to use the term elementary principles, but, but don't think those things aren't deep, okay? What I mean by elementary things is they are the basis. The basics have to form the basis of your life. If you ever get away from the elementary principles, what happens is, is you may know a lot, but you don't have a place for, for power to really operate in your life. And what do I mean by elementary principles? Prayer. Study. Witness. Worship. Fellowship. Service. Okay? The principal things that Jesus told us to do and the principal means whereby you grow in those areas primarily prayer and study if you ever get to the point that you know so much that there's not a reliance on God in those basic and basis areas you find your you find you lose your compass or you lose your engine you either don't know what direction you're heading or you don't have the power to get to where you want to go. Does that make sense? Once you start getting those things in your life, God starts layering precept upon precept. And what we're going to talk about tonight is one of those first precepts that God gives us that God wants you to have on top of those basic uh, aspects of living your Christianity. Okay? It is, it's where you start putting together, there is a burden in my heart as I study and pray that I believe God has given me a direction I want to take in life, I need to take in life, I need to do these things to be pleasing to God and be fulfilled in my heart. And, 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 and then you start realizing that what God has been doing and what God is doing is that He is shaping you in such a way so as you're able to accomplish it. God will not put a burden in your life that He will not provide the power to accomplish that burden. Make sense? And one of the things, not the only thing, but one of the things that God puts into our life on top of those basic things in our life is He wants us to discover, a, if I can put it this way, who we are in Him. And one aspect of growing and learning who you are in Christ is knowing how the Holy Spirit has gifted you. Every believer in this room has been supernaturally gifted by the Holy Spirit to accomplish God's will in their life. God will not call you to an impossible task, and it is impossible to follow Jesus in this dark world without God giving you ability, power to carry it out and one of the things god gives us is he gives us spiritual gifts that frankly are just that they are miraculous in their nature in their ability to move us to accomplish things to have influence with people to be able to focus our minds and focus our efforts okay every christian has gifts every christian is gifted differently and no christian no christian has all the gifts in, in, in a way that they are predominant in their life. You will have expressions of all the gifts in your life. Every Christian, for instance, 
is called to, to show mercy to others. But there is the supernatural gift of mercy showing. Okay, you following me? Okay? God wants us all to be evangelistic, but there is a, a gift for, uh, of evangelism. Does that make sense? And God will not put burdens into your life with, in fact, one of the ways you can discover really where your gifts are is what are you burdened about? What about in the world, in the church, and, 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 and in the community? Are y'all following me? You following me? Because those burdens, that need of your heart, okay, because a real burden is a need. People say, oh, I feel called to do this or that, but they can take it or leave it. They don't have no calling about that. But if there's a real burden, that burden produces a need, and a need can lead you to God's will. That's where you say amen. And if you do not know what I just said, and that, now I know there's some new believers in here and some people had not been around victory for very long that might be going, I don't know what you're talking about, a need taking me to God's will, but there's enough of y'all listening to me preach for long enough that you ought to know what I mean when I say a need can lead you to God's perfect will for your life. Because God will not lead you to a need that he does not already have the supply for it. God doesn't do it like that. He created man where man, man took a breath. Adam, when God breathed into him, man became a living soul. Adam took a breath. Guess what was waiting on him? Air. Before he had a need, God had already provided the supply. And one of the ways that God will supply you to do above and beyond what you think or this world thinks or anybody else thinks, you ought to be able to do in the kingdom It'll be done because God has supernaturally gifted you to be able to do it. That's where you say amen. amen. I can tell that I have let y'all be too quiet too long. How many of y'all ever heard Brother Jim preach? Do you know what this means? Do you know what this means? All right. Because when Brother Jim starts giving you the half step, that's when you better holler back at him. He might come jump on you. Right? So let's practice. Pretty good. Even Jim Bob might have liked that one. I, I didn't go all the way. Here's a. This is just, I'm waving at somebody. Okay. All right. You got your outline? You got your Bible open? Romans 12, 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry, let us use it in ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Roman numeral number one. The gifts. The gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, where we read more about the gifts than in any other particular chapter in the Bible. He says there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. The Spirit of God gifts us, but He gifts us differently. Now, just because you might have a, a predominant gift over here and I got a predominant gift over there. We're not in competition and we're not in contradiction with each other because the same Spirit has given us both those gifts. Think about a human body. That's what Paul likened it to earlier, right? We operate in the body. My heart has to be able to do heart things. My liver has to be able to do liver things. If you got that, say, I got it. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. It do well for Christians to learn that. That God, one, wants us balanced. He wants His church balanced. And just because somebody doesn't have the same burden of heart that you do does not mean they're outside of God's will. It just means that God may be gifting them in that area as He has gifted you in areas that are important to you. No one gift is more important than the other. If God has gifted you somewhere, then that is just something God has given you. Don't get puffed up about it, and don't try to project it to anybody else. If you heard that last week, say, I heard it. You better say it louder, I'll go back over it. Heard it. 
as there are diversities of activities but the same God who works in all, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of us all. Amen? God gives us to be able to minister to one another the ministry of the body to the body. My immune system is fighting off disease so my cardiac system can get blood. Cardiac, that's a Latin term, can get... <laughs> I don't want to go into the depths of the origins of the word so that my cardiac system, uh, my circulatory system rather, can operate properly. Amen. As long as you got it. Oh, I didn't give you a place for this, but if you will write down somewhere to the side, you can write down Ephesians 4. You can write down 1 Corinthians 12. And you can write down Romans 12. In those three places, Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, and Romans 12, we see the apostle through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, rather, gives us an idea of what these gifts look like and how they how they manifest themselves. Now, there, I don't think there is an exhaustive list of the gifts. Uh, different people have different ideas about whether or not there are giftings behind particular positions, i.e. Ephesians 4. You don't hear about the gift of evangelism, per se, but you do see that God gifts the church to the evangelist. If you've ever been around them or we've seen them in the history of the church, those that have that leaning seem to have a capacity given to them by God to have an overwhelming burden and ability to reach lost people with the gospel. I believe that to be so. I believe that there are, there are gifts in line with those positions, everything from the apostle to the prophet to the pastor teacher, okay? We see some of them reiterated in these other lists, okay? Now, basically, and if, if I can use this, and again, uh, this is just what I think, and it goes along in line with a lot of what, a lot of what other uh, uh, Bible students think and some scholars think, but I believe that you can primarily boil down the gifts that God gives under three definitions, and they're there on your outline with a little arrow beside them. There are one, there are the miraculous gifts. There are the miraculous gifts. I was wondering how to spell that. There it is. Miraculous. They, they manifest themselves as God gives them, either in the capacity to pray for, and most of the time it's that way, the ability to pray for the miraculous to occur, or the ability to call in the will of God to be able to call forth that which is impossible and, and it becomes possible. We see this, we see the miraculous gifts in the early church displayed heavily by the apostles, okay? The apostles had the capacity for those miraculous gifts. It would seem almost on call, however and whenever they wanted them to occur. Everything from snakes falling off of Paul's uh, hands uh, and, and them not being hurt by the poison, to Peter and Paul raising uh, people who had died, okay? We see it more evident in the church and as it's listed in these different areas in things like healing, okay? In the gift of tongues, in the gift of interpretation, okay? They are, they are miraculous, I think, primarily from what I've seen in Scripture and experience seen in the world and try to look at things honestly, I think that when they do manifest themselves, they are just that. They are like miracles. They don't, anybody that runs around saying, I got the gift of healing and I can heal anybody and everybody all the time. You got to watch them people. Typically they charge money for such services. That kind of person is not uh, manifesting anything that is by the scripture. Now I'm not saying that a, a prophet's not worthy of his, of his reward. But, but I'm saying that this stuff we see on TV a lot, that, guys, is mumbo-jumbo. Those are charlatans trying to get rich. 
at the expense of people that are in need. That, that's, not, that's not it. I have seen the gift of healing. This woman sitting right here, I seen her go in one time with a heart attack, uh, supposedly had all these clots in her heart. All, we, get there, we do this cast, they're gone. Uh, little Levi uh, Taylor's back here playing out back today, or not playing, they're doing whatever it is, uh, activity they're doing. Um, you know, he was run over by a horse. He's in full-blown posturing. You know, if you know what posturing is, his daddy's a paramedic, a uh, uh, firefighter at the Dallas Fire Department. He was in the ambulance with him when the boy came out of it and was singing one of the songs that we sing at, at church. Um, you know, we have, we, have, we have seen that. I've seen Ronnie Powell when they were planning his funeral, his wife and mother over here listening to what the doctor's saying. God spoke a word into me about praying for his healing. I knew he was going to be healed for a time. And when he rose up that bed, he was supposed to die that evening. He rose up that bed. They sent him home uh, the next day. They said there's no reason for you to be in the hospital because you're supposed to be dead. Brain tumor crawled completely through. looked like an octopus on the MRI scans just running through the tentacles, running through his brain. He spent the next six months preaching, to, preaching Jesus, leading people to the Lord like you ain't never seen in your life. God let me know. Two weeks before he was going to die, he was going to die. I went to see him to tell him he was going to die. I walked in the door. He said, Preacher, I'll be dead in two weeks. That kind of stuff. Okay? Demons fleeing at the name of Jesus. Those kinds of things. Okay? We have to spend all our time talking about him. You go into talking about that, everybody thinks, Oh, this guy's trying to look like a big shot or something like that. I'm, you, you, you follow what I'm saying when we see we see the miraculous. Somebody can't speak no Spanish. He's in somewhere where nobody speaks any English. He opens his mouth and the gospel gets declared. And somebody says, what's he saying? And somebody that ain't never studied Spanish or English starts interpreting it. Because I don't care about your background. You hear what I'm about to tell you. Most of the time we see tongues in Scripture, it's earthly language. It's not... It's not what, what we would call uh, ecstatic speech. Now, you say, Brother Todd, do you not believe in it? I'm going to tell you, I don't know what Paul meant when he said, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. I don't know. There's people believe they got a prayer language. I don't, I don't, I don't, the Bible says for me not to forbid to speak in tongues. So I, don't, I just tell everybody this, you better be led by the Spirit. Amen. It don't matter to me. Now, don't come up to me if I say, well, how do you know what you say? And you say, well, I was speaking a Greek word that, that means praise God. Well, one, that's not heavenly language. That's earthly language. That's Greek. Had a woman tell me one time, I said, how do you know you're not cursing God? She said, well, I, one of the words I looked up in the, in the dictionary, and it was a Greek word for praise God. I said, woman, one, Greek words are not in an English dictionary. Two, you said it was angel language, and you, then you turn around and tell me it's Greek. I think you're not telling me the truth. And she was not. She was trying to angle somewhere. She was trying to make herself out to be something that she wasn't. That's all baloney. Now, you say, Brother Todd, now my grandmama prayed in tongues, and that's how she prayed. Amen. I ain't got no problem with it. I say, Brother Todd, why don't y'all speak in tongues in church? Because every time we meet together, lost people can be saved. First Corinthians 14 tells plainly that we, do, we don't use that gift if we got it in front of lost people because all they'll do is think you're crazy. You want me to get real up, real up on you? You mean getting some of your kitchens? Because I know some of you got different backgrounds you just brought up. Everybody go to speaking in tongues in the church. Did the women ever do it? Did they ever say anything? Said they was led by God? Better watch it. 1 Corinthians 14, the very passage that talks about tongues, tells the women be quiet in the church with it. Oh, I'm waiting on some feminazi to give me some ugly look. Now you say, Brother Todd, I think they're well-meaning. I don't think they're not. I was brought up to believe anybody spoke in tongues in the church had a devil and they needed to have it cast out of them. I, that's all nonsense. I think a lot of well-meaning people do a lot of things because they want to be spiritual. That's what I think. Now, I'm saying it in front of you and that camera. You say, but now, Brother Todd, I have seen it. Amen. Amen. I've made groanings in prayer that I don't know what they were. Oh, I blow your little Baptist mind if that's what you want. I have made groanings in prayer, David Gilmer. I don't have a clue. I know God was tearing the heart out of my chest. I know the burden was so heavy there wasn't a word that could express it. I know that the Bible says that the Spirit of God will give us groanings that cannot be even be uttered. And he'll bring them to God. The old-timey folks used to say, 
black folk where I used to grow up with, old woman used to say, she said, if you'll moan, the devil won't know what you're talking about. Huh? And she just moan and groan in prayer. That's what I'm talking about. If you got me, say I got you. If you disagree, amen. You get, you get, you get to heaven, get it all straight anyway. But there's the miraculous gifts. Then, secondly, we, there are what we would call the enabling gifts. These enable the church to function. These enable, this, these enable us to know what the mind of God is. We see the invisible without seeing it. We hear a still small voice that we never hear with our ears. You say, Brother Todd, what are the enabling gifts? Things like discernment, wisdom, faith. Oh, there is the gift of faith. Okay? The Bible talks about these enabling type gifts. They enable us to carry out our giftedness. They, they enable us to function in the church. They, they enable us to test the spirits. Does that make sense? Knowledge. The Bible talks about the gift of knowledge. Okay? The ability to grasp, to hold the spiritual. The Bible says these things are spiritually discerned. Okay? Everything we have, we've been given, it's been given to us by God. He is spirit, and he operates in the spirit, and he gives us those things. Now, does God use our experience? Yes. Does he take knowledge and experience and blend them together and, and help us manifest wisdom? Yes, but then there is, that, there is that supernatural wisdom that God gives and God holds. And even like Solomon said when he was trying his madness and his folly, he said, but my wisdom remained with me. It's just what God gives. Then there are the ministering gifts. Now, they all minister, but primarily what I mean is these are serving gifts. These are the gifts where, where most of the expression of the Holy Spirit working in you is going to carry itself out. These are the gifts that ain't fancy, but they sure are functional. All right? Everybody running around wanting them big time, miraculous gifts. Why do we want them? We want them so somebody will see us and think we're spiritual. But the reality is if you got them, God gave them to you anyway. So they ain't going to, if it's really God, they won't see you anyhow. They'll just see the Lord. Oh, yeah. You ever run up on the person who loves to run you? Then I have the gifts of healings. And I have, oh, oh, just watch yourself. Because either one, you're prideful, but I would almost just say you're probably just lying. I got, I have. I sought the Lord. He gave me this. Uh-uh. No, no, no. Somebody said, Brother Todd, you got to earn your gift. You got to work for your gift. I thought they was gifts. See, Brother Todd, the only, only way you get the gifts of healing is to really get it. You got to be, pull a 40-day fast. No, 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 no. Bible don't say that. Bible don't say if you won't eat for 40 days, God will throw some miraculous gift on you. What the Bible says is the Spirit gifts as he wants to. You might pray for 40 days, and God may throw it on somebody that can't hold a good thought for 40 seconds. And God will get more glory out of them than he will you. Because you go around telling everybody about how you starved yourself into the gift of healing, and this other brother come in and just say, I don't know, I love Jesus. I sat there one day, and God just dropped it on me. Y'all give him the glory because the God knows I ain't nothing. What are they like? He said, Brother Todd, what are those gifts? Well, again, I don't think there's an exhaustive list. I'm going to give you the Todd Peavy top ten, but that's all they are. You go and say, Brother Todd, I read a book that was nine. You a heretic. No. It's just one of them things we don't know. There's no exhaustive list given. Okay? Don't be mad at somebody else because they think they're, my preacher said there's ten. No. Okay? Can you complete this sentence? Can you complete this quote? In essentials, there is unity. In non-essentials, there is liberty. And in all things, there is charity. 
Love. That's Augustine, boys and girls. Greatest theologian, probably the first thousand years of the church. And he hit the nail on the head with that one. In, in essentials, we have to have unity. I told Sunday, guy shows up and says, I, I don't care what you say, Jesus ain't God. When I realized he, did, he wasn't there to learn, but he was there to fight, he got told to go. Because in non-essentials, in essentials, there's unity. You're not going to stand on my yard, in my yard, without the police or an army making you, me deal with it and, and, and call Jesus Christ a liar, not to my face. I'm going to tell you to go, and I ain't going to bid you God's speed. If you hang around long, I'm going to knock you down and take my dust off your shoes. Period. You say, well, Brother Todd, that don't sound very Christ-like. sounds very Christ-like to me. Because I'm telling you, I'm, one, I'm quoting Scripture, and two, the Lord let a lot of people walk off. Lord never begged anybody back. No. Peter and them used to look at people and, and throw death down on them. I said, well, Brother Todd, that just seems very intolerant. Yeah, them early believers would be very, considered very intolerant of American culture. They, they, they don't know there's this word and that word all start with different letters. They use whatever letter they want anyway. What? Would we say, the ones I can compile to you come from 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and as I see gifts play out within particular offices that God gives in the church. And I think those gifts are there. Sometimes they are, they are used within a particular position. And sometimes the, that ability is used within what we would call a lay person. Now, what does lay mean? It means not a pastor. Okay. If I say he's a lay preacher, it means he's probably not ordained, okay? But he, but he, but he speaks for. Sometimes deacons, we hear you hear him called lay preachers. I think every deacon, if he's really a deacon, ought to be able to tell people about Jesus. I think they ought to be able to preach to some extent. Stephen and Philip seem to be pretty good at it. And but I don't even know what you're talking about. I tell you one thing: we're gonna do. We're gonna preach through the Book of Acts. We're going to preach through the book of Acts. Most neglected book in the Baptist church. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. Oh, in the Baptist church it is. Why? Chapter 2. Chapter 2. Chapter 2 because the, 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 the tongue's falling down on the brethren in Acts 2.38. <laughs> the whole theology of the church of Christ in one misinterpreted scripture. Not the church of Christ but the Campbellites. I don't even know what you're talking about. Most churches run around here got Church of Christ on the sign. They're called Campbellites. They believe in a works-based theology. There's a little Church of Christ woman one time, a guy comes up to rob her. And uh, he grabbed her stuff and took off. Well, she didn't know what to do, but she'd heard Acts 2.38 all her life. So she just starts hollering, Acts 2.38! Acts 2.38! And he stopped. The police got there and said, why'd you stop? This little old woman. He said, that woman was back there hollering. She had an axe in 238. <laughs> David Gilmer, I couldn't resist it. That's terrible, isn't it? Terrible. What is going through his head right now? He's thinking, Lord, Lord, for real. Lord, for real. He said, we got three people come for guests tonight. First time ever. They come, they've been to Church of Christ 30 years. Brother Todd, it hurts their feelings. Now, I'm, I, again, I mean that totally tongue-in-cheek. I know a lot of good Jesus people in that group, but as a, an idea, they have a, they have a their, their, their theology as it comes down from upstairs, as it were, from their hierarchy, is a works-based salvation. I know a lot of people that are saved people in the church. I know a lot of saved Catholics. But they, their trust ain't in the Pope, baby. Their trust ain't in Mary, it's in Jesus. All right, moving on now, I got everybody mad. I got the Pentecostals mad, the Campbellites mad. I got Baptist folk mad, told them they couldn't take Acts 2.38. I've messed up with the Catholics. Who am I missing? Y'all want me to jump on the Episcopalians for a minute? All right. Let's, we might have to go non-denominational around here just to keep from offending folk. But anyway, the, the, the miraculous gifts, say them with me, the miraculous gifts, the... And gifts and the ministering gifts, what are they like? Let me give you one. 
First, we see the gifts of the apostle. This is where I differ sometimes with a lot of people in putting this as an equipping gift. What I would primarily say this is somebody that's a missionary. He say, Brother Todd, now the apostles are gone. Yeah, there's nobody walking this earth. Anybody calling themselves an apostle right now? Typically, people are not using that in a proper sense. The apostles gave us scripture. The apostles saw Jesus, the resurrected Lord. If you, didn't, if you, hadn't, if you hadn't seen the resurrected Lord, I'm talking about physically. You know, you said, well, Brother Todd, Paul was born out of time. Yeah, but he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, and other guys didn't. Paul told us he got his inspiration from God. He didn't Remember he, when he defended his apostleship? He didn't go get it from him in Jerusalem. It was years before he went to Jerusalem. And he tells us when he went and talked to Peter and them, it wasn't to get instruction from them. It was to tell them what God was doing in, in them as God was doing also in the apostles that had followed with Jesus. Those, those, those 12, and I think there's 12, I think Paul took Judas's place. That's what I think. He said, now, Brother Todd, the church elected Matthew. Yeah, because they meant well. Because Peter knew that position had to be filled. What he didn't know was that Jesus was going to fill it. One of the first mistakes the church made, Acts 1. I mean, I really think it's a mistake. I look Peter in the face right now. So you're better Christian than me, brother. But I think you missed that one. I do. I think there's 12. I know there's going to be 12. There's 12 foundations. Judas got replaced, and it's pretty evident from Scripture and the witness of the early church that it was the Apostle Paul that, that took his place. But if you remember, the apostles had a desire to build where no one had built. They had a desire to lay a foundation where there was no foundation laid. That's a missionary gift. Does that make sense? When I say somebody has the gift of apostleship, I'm not saying that they're supposed to be shaking snakes off into the fire. What I'm saying is, is that God has given them a burden to see the gospel go where the gospel's never been. You say, preacher, where do you see it? I can't say his name because it's going out on the internet. But you'll see it in Ephraim Camacho. You see it in Francois Norcilius. Okay? Spend 30 minutes with Ephraim Camacho. Get away from all the hubbub that goes on in the church. Next time he comes, you run to me and say, Brother Todd, we want to take him to dinner. And you see apostleship and prophecy fall down on your dinner table like you don't know still exists in the church. You'll see it. Okay? Oh, it's there. God's still doing it. God is still reaching people that ain't never been reached. That Australian that comes and talks every now and then with us whose name is God not going to be used, is reaching people. Every time you give money to missions, you are supporting people with the gift of apostleship. Somebody, God raises you up in the church, you get a hunger for somebody that ain't never heard about Jesus. And it stirs you beyond your culture. Now you know when people have this gift because they typically can, they typically can minister cross-culturally. Race, socioeconomic background, those kinds of things, education levels just don't seem to matter. They're the kind of person that can go and it sits, sits cross-legged in a, in a, in a, in a tie uh, straw hut and at the same time can show up in England and walk into uh, Buckingham Palace. I mean, they just fit everywhere. Speaking of Ephraim, Ephraim thinks that God's going to use the Filipinos to reach the world. He said, we, meet, we, we, we work in every culture. He said, we fit into every culture. He said, that's why we're all over the globe now. You know, 80% of all the sailors on the planet are Filipino, right? He said, we fit everywhere. He said, I go to Vietnam, they think I'm Vietnamese. He said, I go to Mexico, they think I'm Mexican. He said, I fit in everywhere. He said, I come to America, and, and y'all know that I'm from somewhere else. He said, but other than that. Number two, you see the prophet, or the gift of prophecy. It's listed in the it's first one listed here. Now, the prophet, as they came in the New Testament, I think they followed only the apostles in, in preeminence in the early church. That's why you see here, we'll talk about it in a second, but only do it in proportion to your faith because it would be the, the, the ability to define and declare God's will is a powerful thing. And that's really what a prophet does. 
Now, nowadays, you hear people talk about Old Testament prophets being foretelling and New Testament prophets being foretelling. But really, the, the ministry is the same. What is God's will and the capacity to discern it? These are preachers that, that you, you never hear them preach more than 15 minutes that they don't mention sin at least once. They tend to be powerful preachers. They tend to be people that, for some reason, people can listen to, even though a lot of times they're saying things that people don't like. They may hate their guts when they get done, but they'll listen to them while they're talking. Make sense? That's that gift. You'll see, you'll see this. It's a foretelling, the ability to discern, not just seeing, but what is God's will and declare it. Number three, you see the uh, exhortation. Now, this is in no particular order. I'm just, this is how they came to me off the top of my head. Exhortation is mentioned here. The ability to show somebody how. Number four, evangelism. Already talked about it a little bit. Again, we see in Ephesians 4 that God gave some to be evangelists to the church. They're the ones that tend to move around. A prophet in the in a New Testament church setting today, apostles pretty much would be a missionary. A, a prophet that's that is really operating just within that area of giftedness is what we probably call a revivalist. An evangelist is somebody that goes out and does a lot of preaching that is, is trying to gain souls. But my mother has the gift of evangelism. Okay? Mimi sees people get brokenhearted over their soul. Mimi doesn't see poor, rich, black, white, green. She sees saved laws. The worse off you are, the more her heart is bent towards you. Okay? We got a group going on Friday night. If you hadn't heard, we're going down to uh, uh, Street uh, International Street Church on 2nd Avenue. I'm going to be preaching there the second Friday of every month. You want to go, there's a group leaving here on Friday night. Be here before 545. You catch a ride. But, there, but when I knew when I said it, I thought, well, my mother will be tagging along. Because the more down and out and lost somebody is, the more she's drawn there. This woman will walk up into a motorcycle gang, drinking beer, smoking dope, cooking barbecue, and cry all over them to try to get them to come to church on Easter. I get a call. Brother Todd, I don't know how to tell you this, but your mama's either been kidnapped by a motorcycle gang or she might be there inviting them to church. I said, I imagine she's inviting them to church. If she ain't screaming for help, don't worry about it. Click. Like they come to me later and say, Brother Todd, you didn't even go check on her. Why should I? If the Lord sent her, the Lord will have to be the one to take care of her. Besides that, I scared all them guys. But anyway. Jim Everidge goes, anywhere 30 people get saved. What in the world is going on? Jim, go to a church with 20 people, we get 30 people get saved. They started a church with 30 people, 40 got there, 10 of them had to be altar counselors for everybody. The deacons getting saved, the pastor's wife gets saved, preacher gets saved. I mean, you just see it over and over and over again. Number five, you, mercy showing. Not that we all should not be merciful, but some people have the capacity to connect with someone's pain. Sometimes also this person has the capacity for to start talking to people, and then people start telling them everything that they've ever been through. I even caught myself doing this one time with a mercy shower. I was talking about, boy, and I tell you, I've seen this, and, ooh, I've seen that. And boy, sometimes them people, they come to me in my dream. And then I thought, hold on a minute. Who am I telling this person in their eyes or this big? Tear. Not, not they weren't scared. Tears rolling down their face. I mean, they were so identified with my pain. I told them later. I said, God's given you a tremendous gift. You better keep that before the Lord because that'll crush you. Because, ma'am, while I have dealt with many a person's pain, there ain't two or three people on this planet that I've ever offered any of my pain to. I felt, caught myself looking. I didn't even realize I was talking to anybody. I just got to thinking about things. It was so funny because I needed it. I needed it. I seldom see for years. I have seldom out of tragedy 
revisited that tragedy in my mind where I can't get rid of it. But I was experiencing that. And God sent me a mercy shower just out of the blue. Old woman at the gym. You know the old little woman that's always in your way, tottering around? You know what I'm talking about, Adam? She's over and over. You know, you know, God knows that everybody in this gym knows I need that machine. But you know, she is a little old woman, so you try to... Aren't you Todd P? Yes, ma'am, I am. Well, you pastored whatever. And next thing you know, I'm telling an 80-year-old woman something. I've seen her eyes. Buddy, I'm talking about... That woman had a hold of my pain. And I was like, I said, how long you had that? She said, as long as I've been saved. <laughs> when I was talking to her about it, she said, that's mercy showing. I thought, oh, I ain't dealing with a rookie. <laughs> I said, how long you had it? She said, since the Lord saved me. I said, you've grown it and hadn't you? Oh, yeah. Because your gifts, are all, a lot of times, are given in seed form. And if, if you take care of them, they'll grow. And if you don't, they'll be there, but they just stay small. Anyway, another sermon, another time. Somebody go, amen, amen. let's go on. That was a little weak. Amen. All right, number six. Oh, I pulled a gym on y'all, didn't I? I said, and moving along, and right on your outline, look here. <laughs> gym ever done that to y'all? Here, write this down. Look here. Can't write, you know. Got scribbling all over my paper. <laughs> number six, helping. Helping, service, help. You'll hear it called the gift of help. Usually very anonymous type people. Usually very quiet. They see, see something needs to be done. They just go about doing it. They have a tremendous burden for things to happen. They'll tend to do the little things. If, this is, if you see somebody in leadership with this kind of capacity, buddy, they, they can change the world because they see every hurt and they'll see every need. Okay? You're walking out tonight, there's a little couple right back there. God put two people with the gift of helps together and married them together, Weldon and Marie Crady. Quiet and still as they are, those two people have more of the gift of service and helps in them as any two people God ever seen put together, put together. Period. Weldon's a deacon. Weldon is one of the best deacon servants I have. That's what deacon means, diaconos, servant, that I've ever seen in my life. I was talking him up one day. I was talking about we was going to do this, do that. He comes to me and said, you know, I am getting a little old. <laughs> you remember that well? <laughs> and he would much rather me not be calling his name right now. Danny Treadaway. There's a helper, okay? It's a servant. And God gives him that gift. Number seven is teaching. You see it here. We see it in other lists. We see it listed with pastors, teachers in Ephesians 4. Teaching and exhortation a lot of times look a lot alike, but they, the, typically the difference is in the details. The teacher will get you all up in the details. The exhorter tends to spend more time in application. But if you ever had a Sunday school teacher that had you memorizing in 587 B.C., the, the, the Babylonians invaded uh, Jerusalem, and you had to, before you could get out of class, you had to be able to tell them the timeline. That was a teacher. They give you all the background stuff, Okay. Number, number eight, there's giving. The capacity to be, I would say, a cheerful giver. You watch givers, follow givers, and follow their, their lead, and I'm not a name it and claim it and type guy at all in my theology. I will say this, you can't outgive God. I will tell you that if you want to learn how to handle more money and probably get more money, follow givers around and do what givers do because God makes sure givers have something to give and they 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 don't they don't they don't get that they're not stingy in their giftedness now they can get that way but but they have typically two things the ability to see need and give towards it and they typically have the ability to get it in the bigger they're giving the more money comes to them Tom Robinson was I used to say, Danny Treadway with my right hand and Tom with my left. When I was at Cottage High, Tom was one of our deacons. Tom could pick up a piece of trash and sell it for $5. He, would, he could pick up a can. No kidding. He could, this guy, he's just a regular old dude. He had his own company. 
but uh, he was in the conveyor belt business. But uh, Tom could pick up cans, sell them for $5, and give 10 of it to missions. I never saw nothing like it. Drive by a garage sale? What's that? I don't know. What does he want for it? 20 bucks. Put it out in front of his place, sell it for 1000 then give $1,100 to somebody that was there. I would call Tom on the phone. Hey, I got to give people money, and I can't bring this in front of the church. It'll embarrass them too bad. And, 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 and man, I, 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 I don't know what to do. I, I don't think this person can ever pay you back. But, Tom, I need 1000 bucks. Hey, come down to the cotton gin, and I'll give you the money, and, and I'll buy you dinner. And I'd say, Tom, I, he'd hand me an envelope. I'd say, Bubba, you want to know anything about it? Nope. Tom, I don't think they can give you the money back. Don't want it. Said, tell you the truth, I seen an old bailer on the side of the road the other day. I bought $25, sold it $1,500 out in front of my business. He said, frankly, Todd, I'm going to give you $1,000. I'm going I'm to I'm buy your lunch, and I'm going to spend the rest of it on my wife. <laughs> you know? And I mean, just but, but, but a cheerful, a cheerful giver. The Bible says the Lord used to say God loves a cheerful giver. But nowhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do you ever see Jesus say that. Most people, most scholars think it was just a saying Jesus made a lot, that he said it quite a bit. The, the, you know, the old saying is, God loves a cheerful giver, but he'll also take from a grunt. <laughs> Number nine, pastor shepherd, pastoring. Not the office of pastor, but the giftedness of pastoring. In fact, I've seen more women with the gift of pastoring than I have men with the gift of pastoring. Myself, shepherding. The ability, they, they see people stray and they hold them together, pull them together, pull them together, always meeting the need, see where there's a weak point. And then number 10, because we got a lot of sermon to go here, there's leading or administrations. I, yeah, I just put it as leading. You'll see it called administrations. You'll see it called ruling. You'll see it called leading. Typically, a, administrative, you see, you see two types. You see a task, a leader of a task, and you see a, a person type leader. A person administrator. There's the people that they can look, they can, they typically, a people administrator typically looks more organized than they are. Everybody thinks they're organized because things are happening, but the reality is God's given them a gift to, to get it done. For instance, you don't really want to know how messy my desk is. That's my probably predominant gift, if I have one. Most people, you don't just have one gift. You God will give gift all of us a little bit here and there. He gives some more here. He wants us to be able to do all these things, but he but he'll manifest usually one or two. Sometimes David, would you say maybe three? Probably maybe at most typically, but I mean God can do as He pleases. But but you you typically will see one or two predominant gifts. Okay, my predominant two. I always wanted evangelism to be my predominant gift. But it's not. I want it to be, but it's not. Uh, it, it, am I stronger in evangelism than I used to be? Yes. I, am I better mercy shower than I used to be? Yes. I, well, I got saved when I was 11, but you wouldn't ever accuse me of being a mercy shower. But when God called me to pastor, and the and the need for it was there, guess what? The, God had God knew I was going to need it, so He already gave it to me, and gave me that ability to emphasize with emphasize. Yeah, that word rhymes with sympathize with people. I'll tell any pastor, if a part of you can't die with every funeral you do, you got no business doing funerals. And you say, Brother Todd, that's a hard, I ain't saying it ain't hard. I'm saying if I can't connect to you and your pain, what, kind, what business do I have talking to you anyway? I love and hate funerals. I love and hate, but I hate, I hate seeing people I love. I hate seeing strangers in the pain and emotion and commotion of death. I'm going to plan a man's funeral with him on Friday. There's a part of me, I'm glad to be able to to minister to him, and I have to be able to touch him where he's at. There's a part of me that knows too that when I see him eyeball to eyeball, there'll be a part of me that walks with him in that valley. And that's that gift. 
And nobody would have, if you'd known me as a young man, I'm telling you right now, my mama sat up here shaking her head. I mean, I, 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 was, involved, I was voted most likely to become a psychopath in high school. I mean, I'm just telling you. I mean, it just, it, you just wouldn't have thought that was going. <laughs> what was the old deal? Most voted most likely to take a life. But anyway, well, I just didn't like people. I didn't like people. I didn't really feel sorry for nobody. I, I, you know, kids had stupid parents and old people that was stuck in nursing homes. If they had been good people, James. But if they were sorry people, so what? Getting what they deserve. That's just how I was. I'm not, I'm not proud of it. I'm just saying it's what God gives you that is bigger than your flesh. Amen? I.e., it is a spiritual gift. You know how disorganized I was. You'd never think. I remember dealing with this as I really was dealing with Scripture because I always put administration leadings as, you know, getting a task done. David, I called him. Well, David, can I start a thing? Can I get something started? Hey, David, how, how well do I finish a thing? And you better be honest because you're here in church. Yeah, on a scale of 1 to 10, what is my predominant drive to finish something? A 1? Start a 10. You say, well, Brother Todd, what do you do? I got me a 10 finisher right over there. I got me another one putting up all these little lights. Putting up the little paper, the little uh, wood in the walls and getting their signs up and back there about to start a big college group. Oh, yeah. Now, God, listen, baby, if you want to learn how to get something done, you've got to find out who you are and then find out who God is putting around you that is going to be what you're not. And if you're so prideful that you think it's, it's you or nobody, you're going to be like Elijah in that cave thinking you're the only one in the kingdom doing anything. And then you're going to get tired and want to quit. If you're a heart, you better be moving blood and you better be finding you a set of lungs. Make sense? Why do opposites attract? Why do you think God does that? God does that with us, with our wives and our husbands. One of the primary reasons opposite the track is so we fulfill each other. We, we, we fill in the blanks. Amen? Okay. Now, could we talk about this all night long? Oh, yeah. We could do a night on each one of those gifts and be 10, 11 weeks before we ever got down here to number two. For real. Now, you say, Brother Todd, I, I, how do I know... How do I know really who, who I am? I'll give you a couple of things. Very practical. One, come to Nitty Gritty. Nitty Gritty started up last week. You're not too far behind. At 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, come to Nitty Gritty. One of the things we do in Nitty Gritty is you are going to walk through part of how God has made you your personality and part of it is how has he gifted you. Now, Brother David give you a spiritual gifts inventory that may help you, but it, you can't let it define you. Because a lot of times what you're really thinking about at the time or where you have a need in your life at the time. Uh, when I took my spiritual gifts, first spiritual gift inventory I ever took, I, I saw how the questions were leading. And I was so dishonest with myself that I didn't answer how it was. I answered how I wanted it to be. And so my third gift was evangelism, and it was almost as high as prophecy and, and administration. But I was looking at it, and all the old preachers was like, boy, I ain't seen nobody with three that strong. That's a blessing from God. Man, what a blessing. I'm sitting there going, I'm glad there ain't a gift of lying because I got that one. I done lied to myself. Okay, so... So part of it is that, but, but more than anything is you start kind of getting an idea and then you start doing things that involve it. Any of y'all ever had a teacher that didn't have the gift of teaching? Bless their heart and bless your heart, right? It don't take long. You say, but Todd, I thought I was a teacher. And, and man, it just didn't work out. Amen. So what? No guilt in, no guilt out. Hey, man. Hey, sister. If it's not working, you know what you tried? You did it for Jesus. God will use you where you need it before he'll use you where you're gifted anyway. Oh, yeah, God will do that to keep you humble. 
Every now and then I'll run into one of these people, they know what they're talking about. They know the verbiage, but they don't have the heart behind it. And then they'll be like, well, we want to serve church, but this is where I'm gifted, and this is what I do. And the more they, <laughs> then I will, I, will, I will get Brother David to give them very menial things to do. Because if you can't serve where you're needed, I don't care where you're gifted. Because all you're going to have is a pride problem. And if you've got a pride problem and you're doing ministry here, then that means Brother Todd's got a people problem. And Brother Todd needs one less person problem. Not one more. You find out real quick. You have the, you have the spiritual gift to be in this and that. Good to pick up a piece of trash that's laying outside that office that I throw down in front of you. Wave out there, but strategically placed right there where you're going to walk back, but you're too good to pick up a can, throw it in the trash. I, that's how I test the pastor. I want I stop watching where they sit. Jesus told me that. Don't take the high seat. Take the low seat. I meet up with preachers. I say, who goes for the big chair? And then whoever goes for the big chair, I get away from them because I feel like the devil sent them their way and I not, not God. Oh, yeah. Because you know, somebody got a big name don't mean nothing. I know a lot of sorry people who pastor big churches. In fact, one of the ways if you want to really pastor a big church is be a jerk. Oh, yeah. Not, let me not care about people, but let me care about building an organization where I see you as a cog on a wheel. And I'll, I'll get everything out of you I can, and I'll toss you off, and I'll stick her in your place. And I'll wear you out, and then I'll pick out me somebody else. See people as machinery pieces. You got to remember, guys, a lot of people just see church as a money generating opportunity. Okay. I'm over it. I think I'm doing pretty good. Didn't hardly sweat through my shirt or nothing. Number two. Let's get to the long part of the sermon. Mimi says, oh, oh, God, no. Number two, the grace. We see the gift, but it is, it, it's according to the grace that's given to us. In fact, out beside grace, you might put slash given because they are given. Your gifts come, let me give you three words to start with E. They come without earning. They come without end. And they come without expectation. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. They come without earning, they come without end, and they come without expectation. Say them with me. They come without, they come without, and they come without. What I, by earning means they're gifts. You don't buy them, you don't, you don't earn them. Ephesians 4, 7, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Like a, like a measuring pot. How did he want to gift us out? Everybody says, well, God loves us. He makes us all the same. No, he doesn't. He makes us all the same, and he makes us all unique. We're both. We're all human. We're all different. We're all the same, have the same set of needs, and every one of us in this room and everybody on this planet is different. Okay, God puts us in different stations in life. God gives us differently spiritually. And you say, but hold on a minute, brother. I say, I don't like that because that means God's not fair. Well, well, well here's the thing. God is only going to judge you based on what he has given you. He is not going to judge you by somebody else's measure. He's going to judge you based out of the measure of whose gift? We just read it. Yeah, Christ's gift, his measure. See, God knows what position he gave you in life. Talking about Ephraim a while ago, I was visiting with Brother Ephraim. Y'all be praying for him. Brother Ephraim is wanting me to come to the Philippines in September. And in fact, he wants me to bring Brother David with him because the literature they're using, Brother David wrote. And uh, they're wanting us to come do some preaching, do a crusade and that kind of thing. And I'm praying about it. It's just kind of expensive, so be praying about it. But anyway, I... Uh, I, the first time I got to the Philippines, 
We land in Manila. We're driving out to it, and out in this big bay, it's kind of a harbor thing, you know, just a big old, big old soupy mess. Just so nasty. You you look out, and there's these, uh, like, it's not really boats, and it's not really houses. It's like, it's like somebody had a hurricane and threw all the wood out there in a big pile. It almost looks like it's floating, but it's actually out on stilts. The water there's not real deep. And Ephraim told me, he said, the poorest people in Manila live out there. He said, Todd, sometimes they'll live 30, 40 years. He didn't say 70, 80. And he said, they, they never put their feet on the land. He said, they've never been on dry ground. He said, they fish. And he said, they are some of the poorest people you ever saw. I said, are there any churches out there? He said, there'll be one or two. Some guy, you know, come out there and from here, he said, but it's, it's extremely poor. Well, guys and gals, a saint that's trying to follow Jesus, living out there on that riff rafty little stuff, boats and staked out stuff, is not going to be judged like me and you that came here tonight in a car and had... How many meals a day? Right? God judges us based off what He has given us and what use did we put that to? I'm telling you right now, do not go to hell from East Texas. Do not go to hell from Central Texas where we live well and there is a church on every other street corner. You're going to be judged by what opportunity you have, but only by what opportunity you have. If God in his infinite wisdom gave you that much of the gift of evangelism and you're just going to have to trust him to see if one or two people saved, or he made you an iris blue, you're going to be judged by what you've been given. I hear people tell me this all the time. Brother Todd, I just wish I could talk like you do. I just wish I could get up in front of people and, man, it's just like you just come on. Well, one, that's a gift. And two, I better be using it to the fullest extent because I've seen people struggle to proclaim the gospel whose heart was right with Jesus. They couldn't hardly turn a phrase. I knew a boy when I was a, a kid at, 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 at growing up in Rosser that uh, came in view of a call to pastor our church, and he stuttered. And he fought through that whole sermon. I mean, he stuttered hard. He don't stutter like I stutter a little bit when I get tired. I mean, this brother could not say two words without, without him hanging on it. And he preached. He preached his little heart out. He preached over the loss with tears in his eyes. He, he called for the church. He said, if God, if God called me to preach, I know it. I know I have this speaking problem, but I know he, he took him a long time to say it. But he said, but I know what God's called me to do. Well, it's a whole lot easier for me than it is him. Where frankly, with my personality type and my, my sanguine side comes out and God's primarily gifted me with prophecy, I can get up here right now. I can start telling y'all stories. And I make you cry. There's like I was telling the group going to street church. I said, we won't be doing no raise your hand invitation. I got a hundred of them people to raise their hand. Who was that old preacher used to, old Manly Beasley used to say? Manly Beasley used to say, he said, I used to tell people that if I couldn't get, some, if I couldn't get that man over there to get saved in 10 minutes, I'd quit preaching. And he said, then I realized that was pride. He said, God would give me the gift to do it, but he said, what I was doing, I had learned how to manipulate people. Use who you are. Don't be somebody else. Don't worry about what God's given somebody else. Well, I just wish my wife has just got this so much better than me. Then, amen, I'm glad your wife's got it. Be what God wants you to be. They were given to you. First, First Corinthians 4, 7. Did I? Yeah, four, Ephesians 4, 7, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who makes you differ from another? 
And what do you have that you did not receive? In other words, what do you have that you wasn't given? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? In other words, why are you walking around acting like what God gave you is something you done hatched out when you know good and cotton picking well, God gave it to you. Amen? I've had tried to help a lot of young preachers different times. They'll come over, Brother Todd, I, I, they, they call me. Brother Todd, I want to learn how to outline Scripture. Okay, come over to the house. Open your Bible. Start reading verses. The way God shaped my mind to work for preaching is I start outlining it as soon as I'm reading. In fact, when I'm reading my Bible, I have to specifically not have a pen in my hand because I'll just go to writing sermon outlines. Y'all know how many sermons I preached to y'all on Monday that God gave me in two minutes? You say, well, Brother Todd, you think you're something. No, I know where it comes from. I know where it comes from. I'll be like, Lord, I don't know what to say at this funeral. That, that, ooh, that's good. Ooh, oh, Lord, I'm going to save that for Sunday morning. Here it is. Where does it come? Guys, that's, my mom will tell you that's not me. I was the shyest kid you ever saw in your life. But God does it. Don't go to thinking more haughty of yourself. I was a young preacher. I'd listen to them old guys, and I'd be like, oh, my God, what are you doing? And then I'd think, hold on a minute, preacher. The only reason you're sitting there going, well, I'd say this, and I'd say this, and I'd say that, is because God has given you eyes to see it. That's us. So don't one, don't get prideful about your gift. Now, Christians will do this. They'll go to discovering it. And when you know when you're prideful about it is, one, you resent if anybody else has got your gift. <laughs> Two, if anybody looks like they're better in their gift than you're in yours. And if you're adding to your list. I grew up in church. They was back. They was. I, they didn't know if they wanted to be Baptist or Pentecostal, and so they were. They were really hung up on getting things. And one woman would come in one day with the gift of tongues, and the next week her best friend would be given the gift of tongues and healing. And then the next week, well, this one had the gift of tongues and healing, and then uh, had the ability to prophesy. And they was in this running race. It was like watching two old women in a forty-yard dash trying to trying to outrun each other to get to heaven. Don't add. Be who you are. God's give it. Live in it. Love it. Embrace it. And God will do great things in it. Number two, they are without end. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. One, I say this, that you might be encouraged. Right out to the side, encouraged. I say this, so that you might be encouraged. And I say this, that you might be warned. Would you write down the word warned? Warned, not warm, like a chicken under a hot lamp, but warned. Like don't go over there because the rocks is falling. What I mean by encourage, you did not send away your gift. You have not been so backslid that God has removed your gift. He may remove the expressions of them. If God's given me the capacity to mercy show, but I sin away my qualifications of being a pastor, then I am not ever going to be able to demonstrate mercy in the context of the pastoral office. And contrary to what people think, you can, even before you get saved, sin away your qualifications to be a pastor. Got news for you. You was a child molester. I don't care how saved you got. You will be blameful in the eyes of the world, never blameless, and a bishop must be blameless. Period. You say, Brother Todd, he wasn't even, he was. You get, you get married and divorced four times. And then say, but Brother Todd, I got saved and now I'm qualified to pastor. No, you're not. Because I will never listen to anything you say about my family. You say, well, Brother Todd, that's a hard line. I didn't say it wasn't hard. You got a felony on your background? Felony, especially violence? You're never going to work with our kids. 
I'm going to check out your background. I'm going to come to you and say, here's somewhere you can't serve. We love you. There's places for you to serve here. I can't let you. Uh, you beat up your wife 20 years ago. Put her in a, in a coma. We can't have you working with five-year-olds. You say, well, Brother Todd, that's not right. Oh, no, that is right. I'm not, I cannot put innocent children in a position with somebody I don't know what their temper's really like. Oh, you can mess yourself up. Oh, yeah. I've had a many a preacher. Well, that was all when I got saved. So what? Jeffrey Dahmer, I don't care how saved he got, wasn't going to become the pastor. Just ate too many people. Right? We, got, we have to be realistic in the world. The Word of God is realistic, guys. Okay? Don't need my kinfolk reminding me that I shouldn't have went there. You can wreck yourself. You can wreck. It does not mean that the gift is gone. It doesn't mean that God won't use you. But I'll tell you this. You better get ready to use your gift in a more inconspicuous manner. And you will probably never get the praise in this world that you should get. God heals sin, but it'll leave a scar. And I always do that when I talk about that, because right here on my arm, I got two scars. One, back in the day, we didn't have child-approved toys. Right? Folks let their kids play with big red bottles. Let you shake them up, build bombs out of them. Not calling no names. And I was stacking them on top of each other, and they fell and busted, and the shrapnel went everywhere. Took out two old women in my arm. I got the scar right there. I got a scar right here from one day I was cutting a rope with a knife. And it don't matter how many times your grandpa says, don't whittle against yourself. I was doing it. I was up in a tree, and I cut my arm right there. And a friend of mine had watched the Rambo movie and tried to sew it up with, it with some uh, fishing line. And let's just say he wasn't much of a surgeon. It's healed up. It don't hurt. But it's there. It's a scar. That's why you need to walk holy. That's why you don't need, if you're a young person, don't say, well, I'm going to live how I want to live now, and then one day God will use me later on. Oh, baby, 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 baby. Don't walk that way. God's using David, Patrick, and Butch, but both of them will tell you don't go the way that they went. Amen, boys? Now, the second, I say, one, I tell you that to be encouraged because God hadn't removed it. God will still use it. But be willing to let him use it that, the way that he says is scriptural. Number two, be warned. Christian, you've got to watch this one. Because you cannot be, you can be in a position where you're not filled with the Spirit, but still be able to operate in your giftedness. God gives a gift, it's there. And you've got you to gotta make sure that you're filled with the Spirit and that the expression of that gift is being carried out in a way that's in God's will. Because if not, you can take the good things that God gave you and even use them contrary to His will. Sure enough, contrary to yourself. A lot of good preachers started off this way and turned into manipulators. You don't know whether I'm filled with the Spirit right now or not. You don't. For all you know, I spent 15 minutes before I come out here to preach sticking a needle in my arm. Michael, you don't know, do you? I mean, I pretty much sound like old Brother Todd, right? By the way, I did not put a needle in my arm. But you say, oh, I'd be able to tell. Oh, I'd be able to tell. Yes, preacher I ever heard was a child molester. Best preacher I ever heard had a thing for seducing 16-year-old girls. Daryl Gilliard. I'll say the name right here in public. Take the best preacher you've ever heard, multiply him by 10, he couldn't carry this guy's suitcase into, the, into a barn. As far as the ability to, to preach, David, you heard him. 
Honestly, guys, I'm being honest. As far as preaching goes, declaring it, here was him. And here's the next best preacher I've ever heard. It was not even comparable. He could out-preach the ten best preachers I've ever heard. May stand up and deliver saying truth. After that brother fell, people was calling me. Oh my God, I got saved under his ministry. What do I do? I said, well, love Jesus. Jesus saved you, not him. Well, can I trust what he said? Well, did he tell you the Bible? Well, yeah. Well, how could God do that? How, how could he do that? Hey, I'm going to tell you what, guys. If the gospel is preached, whether out of an honest heart or Paul said out of contention, the gospel has power. What I mean by you got to use it as a warning is the, sometimes at church, we, one, get good at what we do. You get used to a ministry. You get used to being able to stand up. Think about it, teacher. You used to be so, no, so nervous about preaching your, your class that you would pray for 45 minutes before you ever even started studying. But do you still pray like that? No, because you're comfortable with it. I'll be honest. I pray more when I'm going to preach somewhere else than I do y'all. I'm just telling you, it's a battle because there's a familiarity here. I know Angie and I love Angie. And we already, we're already in sync, you know. I'm not going off somewhere where I don't know them. You say, well, brother, but you don't know me, but yeah, but you're in the minority. I know most people in here. You let me go to the Philippines, I'd be praying all the way. What is that? Just to be honest. It is we get to walking in where, where God has allowed us to be comfortable. We get to walking in what we know God has given us. Baby, you got to be warned. How many of y'all know who Jimmy Swagger is? I mean, okay, Jimmy Swagger. I, I love old brother Jimmy. I hope he does well. I hope God restores him and all that kind of stuff. But when he had all his little failings, the second time he was messing around with the prostitutes, he come back to the church. It wasn't none of their business. And, uh, and he validated it by saying, I woke up this morning and spoke in tongues. And Leonard Ravenhill said, all you did was walk in the gift that God had already given you. Because the gift and callings of God are without repentance. But it doesn't mean nothing about you being filled with the Spirit. Does that make any sense? You can slough off on your gift. You can go to resting in it because you know what you're doing. But baby, if there's no Holy Spirit unction in it, it won't produce anything eternal. I hadn't seen as few of people saved in my preaching as I have in the last five weeks. And if you don't think for one second, I'm not tearing down everything I'm doing. Everything we're doing, but mostly everything I'm doing. Because one, we don't save nobody. The Holy Spirit saves us. But I'm gonna tell you one thing I don't want to do. I want to get up, I don't want to get up here and preach Jesus, and He's gifted me to preaching, and it not have a fire in it. And I don't mean just because I scream. Because I can get up here and act like I'm all kinds of full of the spirit. Oh, y'all for y'all, you know I'm just having a fit. Screaming and hollering ain't necessarily the fire. God will teach you when to holler and God will teach you when to whisper. And when the unction's in it, there's as much thunder in your whisper as there is in your, in your hollering. In fact, most of the time, most preachers holler and scream when their points are weak anyway. It's called diversion. To get you all, woo, boy, listen, Brother Todd, I ain't telling you nothing you ain't ever heard. I'm just doing it in a way that made you all excited. Christian entertainment. Oh, yeah. Say, Brother Todd, not us. Oh, baby, we got to watch it every step of the way. If you ain't wise enough to watch, baby, you won't ever really be used. Let's move on. There's, they're, they're without earning. They're without end. And they are without expectation. In other words, they ain't coming along later. You know my favorite word in verse 6? Having. I love that word, having. I got them. I don't have to get in here and pray for God to gift me. Somebody says, well, 
You better pray that you get this gift and pray that you get that gift. Got them. We got the gift. Now, they may be small. They may be in seed form. But, baby, when the Holy Spirit saved you, he gifted you. You say, well, don't know. I disagree with you, Brother Todd. Well, one, you're wrong. And I'll tell you why. Because the Holy Spirit saved you and gifts you to do his work. He is not dependent upon you coming to a point of maturity where you recognize there's a need that he hasn't met yet and that you've got to come and pray to God to get him to do what you're so spiritual you know God needs to be doing for you. Nah. Ah, 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 ah. You may not have discovered it yet, but what you'll find out is when you're coming along in your maturity and you say, oh, God, I need you to give me, he'll say, check your closet. Had it in there for five years. You're just now getting smart enough to look for it. It's there. God is not waiting on us to get mature enough to tell him what we need. And some of y'all are looking at me like, Brother Todd, that, that would be stupid to do that. I'm glad you got that look on your face because that means it tells me you ain't never had that thought. But that's a predominant failing of maturing Christians. God gives them something. They start thinking they got it because they're so dedicated or they're so prayerful or they're so studious. And God helped the worst one is they're so smart. Listen, if you're smart, would you please be smart enough to not tell other people your IQ number? Would you at least be that smart? You might be smart, but could I ask you about being intelligent? Because you know who you're really telling that to? You. You're trying to make yourself feel good about your other inadequacies, and you're compensating by the fact that God lets you figure out a problem. I'm glad he made you smart. I'm glad they're smart people in the world. I got put in a new sprinkler system yesterday. My cell phone tells it when to come on. It's like magic. Make me want to get a top hat and a cane. I don't know what's happening. I don't even care about it. I don't care to know. I just want it to work. If you one of these Christians got to run around telling everybody how smart you are, what you need to do is thank God for what God's given you intellectually, but you better start depending on what you can't explain except for calling it supernaturally. The biggest downfall of any Christian on this planet will be to have a great intellect and not have it yielded to God because what you'll be is crazy. And I'm not saying it facetiously. You'll be nuts. Some of the smartest Christians I ever knew in their 20s cannot hold a job in their 40s. They have overanalyzed and expected perfection and try to get things done with what they think they can understand. Danny, we could start saying some names right now, couldn't we? I know a brother talks about a 170. Could have been a phenomenal Christian writer until he decided he wanted to become a great writer and a great speaker. Now he's divorced. His kids don't like him. He can't hold down a job. Guy picking up cans on the side of the road more money than he did this week, and I'm telling you, he's Einstein smart. They're without expectation. You have them. Number three. Yeah, some of y'all give me the wrap it up look. <laughs> and I don't blame you. I'm tired of me talking sometimes too. One, the gifts. Two, the grace. Three, the going. The going. What do we mean by the going? Well, if God has gifted you, be sure you're doing what God has gifted you to be doing. Verse 6, 7, and 8. Half of 6, all of 7 and 8, basically is an encouragement of he gives a, a little bit of a list he gives us a few of the gifts but he says if you got these gifts be sure you're doing something with them so i just write down here on the bottom of my little page i need to avoid the pitfalls and i'm not going to we can't talk about all 10 of these but we will talk about the ones that the spirit gives us here in romans chapter 12 there are pitfalls to all the gifts if you'll notice here he he touches on each of these. One prophecy, do it in proportion to our faith. 
keep yourself in pos the position God's put you in. Like I say, a lot of times you will see prophecy manifest itself in speaking. And the, abil the ability to know God's will and, and the ability to convey what God's will is and how to get out of God's will. Guys that tend to have a natural tendency to be a hellfire and damnation preachers tend to all be gifted hearers. But it's not just a preaching gift, okay? You, you may have this now in the, in the New Testament, especially in those early days, you, you really saw the gift of prophecy operating. And it seemed like they operated only behind the apostles. And what this is saying here is be sure you keep your place. Don't ever get to thinking you're more than you are, okay? Now, you'll see people talk about prophecy and that kind of thing in church today. You ever been in one of these meetings where somebody's going, I, I just get the feeling that there's somebody here that's battling with bitterness. That's not New Testament prophecy. That's, that's learned behavior. That's hogwash. New Testament prophecy is Agabus walking over and picking up a coat and going, whoever belong, this belongs to, you're going to jail. You're going to be in chains. Who coat is this? Paul says, is my. That's it. Well, Brother Todd, I felt like this person was talking about my marriage. Baby, if I get up here right now, I just feel like there's people in here you you got some problems in your marriage somewhere. I just I don't really know who you are, but I just I just get this sense that he's just not really understanding you. I just hit ninety nine percent of you married ladies, right? Because you've got that feeling. I just don't know that he gets me sometimes. Because he don't. Well, that's another sermon for another day. The, if you want, if you say, brother Todd, does that still happen? Oh yeah, that still happens. That's the, that's the guy that's taking part in the exorcism. One guy looks over at him and goes, what are you doing here? You were with three prostitutes last night. It's the guy that's preaching, hits the brakes and goes, you cheating on your wife? I'm going to look, make, sure, make sure I'm looking at nothing. <laughs> hey, is there a Joe over here by chance? Anybody named Joe? Okay. Are you, Joe, you're cheating on your wife, ain't you? That, that, that's, that's that. That's that miraculous gift of prophecy. If God's given it to you in any way, especially if you can sense sin, you have discernment, you have to watch this with your enabling gifts. David, David Patrick's got more discernment than probably anybody I know. But where David has to watch, he has to make sure he operates in the measure that Christ has given it to him in. Because if not, he becomes the judge and jury of everybody that walks by him back there. You see what I'm saying? Not that he does that. But if you have that kind of gift, then you kind of watch everybody when they come into church. Oh, he looks spiritual. Oh, he got a problem. You see what I'm saying? Self-appointed righteousness detector. Okay? They usually have an opinion on everybody else's walk but their own. Ministry, teaching, exhortation. He basically says make sure you're accomplishing it. Make sure you're doing it. It's always easier to talk about what needs to be done than it is to do it. Does that make sense? Must be getting late. Y'all got awful quiet. I done played you out, hadn't I? Yes, I, yeah, you did. It's, it's late. I got to go home. I'm tired. Let me give you the last three because he gives, us, he gives three different cautions here. One, that you give and you don't get greedy about it. That you give and you and you and you do it liberally. Don't measure. If God's given you the gift of giving, then pour it out. People with the gift of giving typically don't have a problem tithing and giving offering. But you got to watch that you could you, that you don't go to feeling like, well, ain't nobody else giving, I'm not gonna give, or nobody else doing it. You know, you want to be stay liberal. Lead. You have to do it with diligence. In other words, you can't get lazy. Like right now in the church, my, my whole, the last few years, my whole day is different. My days are different. I don't spend 12 hours running to hospitals like I did for the biggest part of my ministry. So if I've got that, if I, hopefully we've got that happening, and we definitely got good people looking after it, but I have to stay diligent. Because while I give away ministry, I've got to make sure I'm putting my effort into the main thing. In my case, it's prayer and study. 
and the, and the ministry of the Word. And if I'm not, then the tendency is to coast. You have to watch when you're the leader. You've got to still make sure you're one of the hardest working people on the team. Amen? And lastly, that you show mercy with cheerfulness. In other words, that you don't get jaded. You don't get jaded. Now, guys, we run through that. I know, and I know it's late. What I want you to do with this message today is, is there a couple of places here that, that makes your heart beat faster? Are there a couple of things that we talked about here, and are you serving in those areas? Now, is there more to serving and knowing who you are than giftedness? Yes. In fact, I think next week what I will probably do is we will take this as a basis. We're going to work through gifts, and we're going to work through some of the things we do in Nitty Gritty about you finding out who you are. Because I'm telling you, you learning who you are and you learning who other people are will help you minister in the church, and it'll help you help people better than anything else. Everything from how, what somebody's personality is like to identifying what their spiritual gifts are. Because when you get those things and you can see them in other people, then you can appreciate somebody's style. You ever notice how in your family you got people that would get on everybody else's nerves, but y'all love them? Because you go, oh, that's just John. Oh, that's just Sue. Right? Because you appreciate their style. You see what they can be. You see what they want to be. You know what you want them to be. And so you deal with them differently than a stranger out there on the street that gives you a crazy look. If somebody I know gives me an odd look, I don't think anything about it. Total stranger gives me a, a punking me out look. I'm a 50-year-old man. It still gets under my skin. And I'll scowl before I'll smile. That's my tendency. You know, I'm not saying it's right. But the more we know and the more as you interact with each other, you'll find that the things where you thought maybe before somebody was getting, trying to get on your nerves or belittling you, you see it's their heart. You see it's everything from their personality to what they've been through you know, and, and it doesn't offend you. And if you get to the point as a Christian that you're not easily offended and you're operating in your gifts, I got news for you, baby. You're maturing. If nothing else, that's grown-up Christianity. Let's pray together. We're going to dismiss. Before we go tonight, I hope you'll take this with you. I know Hello. I want to thank you for spending this time with us today. I hope there was something that happened during the, the message or maybe during the, some of the singing that you saw that, uh, that spoke to you in some way. You know, one of the great things that happens when we talk about God's Word is God starts talking to us. You know, the Word of God says, in fact, Jesus, the Son of God, said that unless the Father draws someone, they can't come. One of the great things is that the Spirit of God, working in harmony, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he seeks us and he calls us and he draws us to himself. You know, if you're listening to me right now and you are already a Christian, you know this has already happened in your life at one point or another. Maybe now you're, as you listen to the Word of God, you're, you're feeling him talk to you. He's probably leading you towards some type of decision. I want to encourage you, if God's moving you, to, to accept a challenge or... Uh, to take a step of faith, to, to just listen for God and expect that He's going to uh, help you, that He loves you, and that you're one of His children. Sometimes as He talks to us, it's not real comfortable. We have to remember that the Bible tells us that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And sometimes He does speak to us and lets us know there's a problem so that we see His Son is the solution and we kind of get back on track. If we can help you with that here at Victory Church, we'd love to. You can contact us uh, uh, through the website, uh, online, some way or another. I'm sure you can find a way. And, um, and we'd love to get to help you uh, uh, grow in your walk. Uh, perhaps, as you listen today, you've never really come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're experiencing that call for the first time. Uh, the Bible says God's not the author of confusion. So if he's speaking to you, he's, he knows what he's talking about. He's if you heard during the message, there was probably a time where I was talking about coming to faith or, or being saved, as the Bible calls it. It's where God calls us out of the darkness of our sin and the separation that's caused by our sin as we recognize and we come to believe that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. He paid that price. He rose from the grave. He's alive, and he can give us life. 
And the Bible tells us that when we, when we come to a point of faith in that and we begin to speak to God about it, he enters into our life, he makes us his child, and he begins to make all kinds of, of great and wonderful promises to us. But there's two things that are absolutely essential, and that is that we believe uh, that Christ has died for us, that he's rose from, uh, for us, that he wants a life with us, and that our sin has us separated. You hear two big words when you read the Word of God. You hear belief and you hear repentance. We repent of sin means we turn from it, and we repent because we believe. We believe that Jesus Christ is our substitute for sin. He died on the cross in our place, and he rose from the grave. The Bible says to give us life. The way that begins to operate in our life is the Word of God says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the reality is, is that God calls us so that we make a choice towards him and we show our belief in that choice by believing enough to pray. Real faith always has, uh, it always produces something. It produces a work. In this case, it produces us believing enough to act, to speak towards a God we've never seen. We've never seen with our physical eyes or heard with our physical ears, but yet we know and we believe that he's leading us out of darkness into light and he's, and he's speaking to us. We, it's, it's, it's the loudest voice we never hear, so to speak. Loudest sound you'll never hear is the call of God into your life. But it's real. And if you understand if uh, the things we talked about today in the message, what I'm talking about right now, if God's calling you, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. You need to come to that point of decision. Um, and the way you do that is to pray. Now, you don't need my help to do it. You can right now just ask the Lord to forgive your sins, tell him that you believe that he died for you on the cross, he rose from the grave, that, that you want to repent of sin, turn from sin, and turn to him. And somewhere in there, the Lord will meet you in that faith, and he will save you. The Bible says for as many as have received him, and those that want to believe on him, the Bible says he, he calls those people his children. In fact, it says he gives them the power to be the children of God. If you say, preacher, I don't really know what to say. In just a second, I'll lead you in a prayer where you could pray and ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior, but I want you to really understand what I'm about to say, and I think you probably know this. You, you don't get saved because you repeat after a preacher. You've got to believe what you say to God. But if you do believe that he died for you, he rose from the grave to give you life, that you want to turn from sin, then just bow your head right there where you are and just say these words out loud while I say them along, but be talking to God. Just say something like this. And say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm lost, and I know I can't save myself. But with all my heart, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the grave, and you can give me life. I ask you to come into my life, to be my Lord. I'll try to follow you, to be my Savior, because I need you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Give me a new life in you that you tell me about in your word and help me to begin to walk with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name and just say amen. And if you're here, if you're listening to me right now and, and deep in your heart you know that you wanted to accept Christ as your Savior as he was calling you and you wanted to turn from sin and have him forgive your sin, then in the simplicity of, of that prayer and in the simplicity of faith, the Word of God says if you received him and believed in him, he gave you that power to be his child. Now, there's things to do. There's a life to live. There's great things that are going to happen in your life, and God wants to lead you through them, and you're going to need some help. If there is a Bible-believing church somewhere around you, and you'll know where that is because they talk more about Jesus than they do anything else, but uh, if, if you don't have a place like that around where you're at or you can get to, you can contact us here at Victory Church. Our web uh, address is victory-church.net, and you found us here on the Internet, so I imagine you can probably find our homepage. Just find us, send us a note. There's a way there to contact us. You can call the church. Uh, if you're where you can get to a call or call into America, it's 972-452-3751. And you can give us a call, and we'll try to help you with the things that you need to do next. I'm so proud for you, so glad for you. If, if, 